And we are continuing through the Gospel of Luke in chapter 21. Last week, we had a, our guest speaker, Pastor Brandon. He took us through the first eight verses where Jesus is in Jerusalem and he's teaching in the temple and he looks up and he sees these rich putting in their uh, in gifts into the treasury and he also sees a, a poor widow putting in two mites. And this is what he says in verse 3. He said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. And so Pastor Brandon last week drew our attention not so much of, to the giving of the widow, but the heart behind the giver, right? And we talked about how when we give, it costs us something. And to the, the rich that were giving out of their abundance, it didn't cost them nearly as much as the widow who gave essentially everything she had. And it was as if Jesus was looking at this widow and said, that, right there, that's what I'm looking for. That's the heart that I'm looking for, someone who's all in, someone who trusts in me with everything they have. You know, and, and I was look, thinking about this this last week, and I, and, I, and I think that majority of us in this room can relate to the widow more than we can the rich person the rich people in this story, all right? I, I think, you know, a lot of us are living paycheck to paycheck or you're living off your student loans. And I, and I was just thinking, how can we, even today in our situation, how can we do as, as it says here, uh, you know, putting in the livelihood, she put in the livelihood that she had. How can we put in with the livelihood that we have? You know, I was praying about this and I was really thinking about this and, and I was thinking, you know, God loves a cheerful giver, and that's what scripture tells us. But I also know that, you know, all of us, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, we go out to eat, we go get drinks, we go do all these things, right? And, and those things are, are things that have no eternal purpose. I mean, they're fun. They're, they're awesome things to do. I love to go out to eat. You know, if you know me, you know I love my shawarma king. But, the, but those are, have no eternal purpose. And so I thought to myself, what would it look like for us to cheerfully give Maybe skip that meal, skip the, count the cost of, of whatever it costs for that drink or that meal, and we gave it to something that had an eternal purpose, something that will last forever, something that will, that will, you know, God will use to bring people closer to him. And so I, I just want to challenge you with that week, this week. Just think about that as you go about your week, and, and maybe how, how you, like this uh, widow, can give out of the livelihood that you have. And so as we kept going in, in verse 5, we saw that there, well, there was this, these people, and they were admiring the beauty of the temple, right? And, and as they're doing this, Jesus said, predicts now for the third chapter in a row the destruction of the temple. Now, in the previous chapter, he's just talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, but we can kind of put those together because the temple is in Jerusalem, and he will talk about the destruction of Jerusalem once again this week. But he's talking about, and he says, These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so at this, they ask, when will these things be? What are the signs that there will be when these things are about to take place? And, and so this question actually begins one of Jesus' most famous uh, teachings, and it's called the Olivet Discourse. And it's the Olivet Discourse because in the, in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, it makes it very plain that he gave this teaching when he was on the Mount of Olives. Therefore, it's called the Olivet Discourse. And so in Matthew, and what we're about to dive into here in the book of Luke, he makes it very clear that Jesus spoke of two things in this Olivet Discourse. He spoke of the near destruction of Jerusalem that would happen in 40, uh, 40 years after Jesus says these words. And he's been talking about that in the last several chapters. And he, he spoke of not just the destruction of Jerusalem, not just the destruction of the temple, but also the end of the age and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to start in verse 8. But before we do, let me just take this to the Lord one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you. Thank you for what we're about to read and the truths that are in it. Lord, that we can see that the things, some of the things that you predicted here already have come to pass. And Lord, let, let that be an encouragement to us that the things that, you, that you've said that haven't come to pass yet, that we're still waiting on your second coming, that it will come true as well because your words will not pass away. 
And Lord, as we read these things, I know that they're, you know, not all of us see eye to eye on what the end times, what that looks like and everything, all the, the, uh, all the things that involve that. But Lord, we know that you are coming back and you tell us over and over again to be ready. And so, Lord, I pray that that's our hearts this morning, that as we listen to it, we're, we're encouraged by it, but we're also ready our hearts for your coming because we don't know when it can, it's going to come. It can come tonight. So, Lord, I just pray that over us this morning. I pray that we can look past the differences and, and, and just unite in what we believe together. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, let's start at verse 8 in Luke chapter 21. And he said, Take heed that you not be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And the time is drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. And so he's talking about them going after these false leaders, these false messiahs. And so Pastor Brandon, this is the verse that he, he ended on, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I believe the message is clear, right? In the years immediately after Jesus' crucifixion and on in the first and second century, there have been no shortage of false messiahs in and around Judea. And even since then, there hasn't been a shortage of them. I mean, Pastor Brandon mentioned, mentioned some, and, and I think you can probably think of some in the, even in our modern time. You know, I think of the Rastafarians, for, for instance. And so Jesus is warning them now that, hey, this is going to happen. And so don't go after them. Don't be deceived. Let's keep going, verse 9. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not immediate, will come immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against na kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be a fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Now, I want us to understand what he's saying. All right, I want us to look very carefully here at verses 9, 10, and 11 and understand what Jesus is telling us. He's telling us that those things that he just mentioned are not signs of his coming, of the second coming. The things he mentions, he says, when, when you hear of wars and commotions, don't be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. I mean, that's the whole point there in that verse, in verse 9. Jesus specifically said that none of those things were going to take place and be specific signs of his immediate coming. And I like how Jesus describes them in the, the same discourse, in, like we mentioned already in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 8. He describes these things as being the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of sorrows. And it's a very picturesque phrase that he uses in the ancient Greek because essentially it, it kind of has this intonation of being the beginning of labor pains, right? Now, I'm not a woman, nor have I ever been a woman. I've never given birth, but I have on great authority my wife. And I imagine that, that the people in here who've had children can attest to this, that when you're having a child, the labor pains and those things just tend to increase the, in, in, the intensity and, and frequency until the child is born, right? And so that's kind of the idea of, of what he's getting at here. It's, it's very picturesque. And, and, and so I think we can remiss from that, so remiss from that, that it, from what he says in chapter 24, that these things that he's talking about, the wars, the earthquakes, the famine, the pestilences, and none of these in, in and in themselves will be the sign. But that's been the tendency of human beings for as long as I can remember, as long as I've been a human, which has been my whole life. I don't know about you, but my whole life. <laughs> that, you know, when something happens, like, say like there's, there's this cataclysmic war or something crazy is going on, like, like we're seeing in, in Russia and the Ukraine, and we think, oh man, this is the end. And Jesus is like, no, no, it's not. Or, or, you know, in other parts of the world, maybe not here, but the famine's happening. And people are dying from, now, uh, from malnutrition. And they think, oh, man, this is the end. And Jesus is like, no, it's not. None of these things individually are the same. But since they are the beginning of sorrows in the sense of labor pains, as we just mentioned, we would expect that such things would increase intensity and increase uh, until the time of the end would approach. And so that being said, we are seeing a little bit of that. And so we can have some reason to believe that the, the end times are on the rise. As a matter of fact, when we're going through the book of Luke and really all throughout the New Testament, we are to live our lives in such a way. 
that Jesus is coming back. We would have got to watch and be ready. And that's exactly what he says at the end of the chapter. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go on to verse 12. But before all these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle in your hearts not to mention beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Now, notice what Jesus is saying here. In addition to all those things that are going to be happening around the world, you know, all the earthquakes, the wars, the famines, and catastrophes, all those things, Jesus also say, hey, you're going to have your own personal calamities, that you are going to be persecuted. And so they're going to take you. And what did he say? He says, you're going to be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and they will lay hands on you and persecute you. Now, again, no Christian should regard this as the uh, particular persecution that we're in as the ultimate sign of, of his coming back. But rather, we should expect as believers in Jesus that that just is part of course, that that belongs to a believer, a follower of Jesus, that there is going to be persecution. But notice what he says in verse 12. He says, and they will deliver you up to the synagogues and prisoners. So what does he mean? Well, it means that this persecution that, that they're going to suffer, well, it's going to come at the hands of the religious source and the synagogues, and it's, come, it's also going to come by a secular source, you know, the, the, the Roman government and so on and so forth. But it will come against you. It's not if, it's when it will come against you. But notice here in verse 13 that there's going to be good news in the midst of this persecution. And I hope this brings you encouragement for yourself as well. He says, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. And so Jesus is saying, yes, you're going to be persecuted. Yes, you're going to be brought before the magistrates and the officials and, and all that stuff. But it's going to be an opportunity for you to give a testimony. And God will use it even in the midst of your persecution. I mean, as we look at Scripture and we, and we look at, at, at our society, has not the promise that Jesus, of Jesus here been fulfilled over and over again within the church? I mean, isn't it amazing just how God can use a man or, wo or a woman in the midst of their persecution? You know, we, we've seen a direct example of this on Wednesday nights at Life Group as we've been going through the, the book of Philippians. I think Paul is a great example of this, and he writes about this very thing. He talks about being able to be used by God and, and using his persecution as a way of testimony. And this is what we just got done with uh, chapter 1. And this is what, something he said in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. He says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which has happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And he, he's speaking from prison. He's writing this from prison, right? And so that, that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And so he's using his persecution that he's, he's taking on as a way of giving testimony to the palace guards and all the rest. And not only that, he's writing to the Philippians who are also going to be under persecution, and he's encouraging them, hey, I know that you're going to be un under persecution, but look at me. God's still using me even under my persecution. So you can let God use you. You can still preach the gospel in the midst of your persecution. And so I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think even today, there's hundreds and hundreds of people just like Paul all over the world are being persecuted for Christ's sake. And they all have an opportunity just like Paul for a testimony. And get this, Jesus makes such a beautiful promise regarding this testimony in verse 15. He says, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Now, I want you to notice that phrase. He didn't say in a generic way, a mouth and a testimony would be given to you. He didn't even say the Spirit was going to give you a mouth and testimony. He makes it very personal. He says, I am going to give you a mouth and testimony. And so I think about that, and I think about in the midst of my suffering, in the midst of your suffering, Jesus says, I will be very close to you. In the midst of your persecution, I will be close to you. I'm going to give you a voice. I'm going to give you a mouth in the midst of your suffering. 
And I think this is important for us to understand because a lot of us say, well, you know, I can't say anything. I don't know what to say. But here he is saying, don't worry about that. He'll give you a mouth. He'll give you the words to say. It is a very powerful and very precious promise that Jesus gives us here. And I hope you can take that to heart next time you are trying to decide whether you should open your mouth for Christ's sake or or not. Now let's keep going in verse 16. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But then he says, but not a hair of your head shall be lost, but your patience possesses your soul. You know, I think these words in verse 16 kind of hit you like a slap in the face. He says, you will be betrayed. And people that you've trusted, people whom are your friends, you know, some, sometimes even your own family will betray you under persecution. You know, I, I imagine those who are, who are enduring this, who and, and maybe just, this, this, you know, going under persecution, these persecuted believers, they can open up their Bibles to what Jesus is saying here, and, and they find some comfort in it. And, and, and I say that because of this. Jesus knows it's going to happen. He predicts it right here. He, he knew it would be so. It doesn't catch God by surprise that, that this, this is going to happen. He told us that we were going to be betrayed. And because of that, someone even die, he says here. And, he, and why? Verse 17, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. You know, I, I think about that. You know, I, I was meditating on that. And, and I just that particular verse, you will be hated for my name's, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. And I think about that. I think that's absolutely crazy. I mean, think about Jesus. He, he loved perfectly. He forgave perfectly. He was the perfect person. He was the most perfect person that ever walked the earth. He was a person who healed the sick, who, who you know, who, who fed the, the hungry, who cleansed the lepers, who went to the cross in the most sacrificial way so that we could be saved. And people will hate you and hate me because we're associated with him. That doesn't make any sense to me. But that's just the madness of the world that is in rebellion against God. And so they, they're gonna, you'll be hated. They'll be hated for my name's sake, for Christ's sake. But then he says something very interesting in verse 18. He says, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. And I think about that and I kind of scratch my head because didn't he just say previously that, hey, some of you are going to die. And so what is he talking about? What does he mean not a, not a hair of my head is going to be lost? Well, I think what we have to realize that what Jesus is, is speaking, he's speaking in a very powerful and very passionately, and he's speaking in a way that has an eternal perspective. You know, all throughout the, the book of Luke, we've, we've talked about it. Like, he's telling us to think heavenly, think, have an eternal perspective, have kingdom first, look at, at, at the heaven. That's how you're going to avoid all the troubles of earth, just keeping your focus on heaven. And I think that's, that's the kind of mindset that he has here. He has an eternal perspective. From an eternal perspective, not a hair of your head shall be lost. You know, it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse, verse 28. He said, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body. And so he says, not a hair of your head will be lost in it, from an eternal perspective. But then he says in verse 19, but by your patience possesses your souls. And so the word patience here in the, in the Greek speaks of the strong endurance. It's this strong endurance, not this passively waiting. And so what Jesus is saying is we are to endure, trusting the promise that, that Jesus, that ultimately in an eternal, eternal perspective, not a hair of your head will be lost. So now we're going to go on to verse 20, and, and, and I'm going to read verse 20 to about the middle of verse 24, and, and, and you'll see why here in a minute. So verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that the desolu- desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. 
and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And so Jesus is warning his listeners here, right? And he's warning them knowing that these words are going to be written down for that generation. They're going to read this and they're going to, they're going to know. And he's warning them for the third time now about the attack that would, be, uh, that would happen in approximately 70 A.D., and, and so this focuses on the, the near aspect of this prophecy. And sadly, the Jewish people virtually ignored this warning by Jesus in 70 AD when a Roman army circled around Jerusalem. Jesus said, when you see what's about to happen, in verse 20, 21, he says, let those that are in Judea flee to the mountains. In other words, he's saying, put it in B for boogie and get out of there. Get out of there, Right? Because in 70 AD, the Roman army, they encircled Jerusalem. And this is why. And, you know, I've talked about that, but I've never really talked about why. Here's why this happens. It's because there's a, a violent and bloody rebellion of the Jewish people against the, the Roman overlords in the years preceding that. And finally, the Romans had enough. And, and they, they come and put order, they bring order back to it under the leadership of Titus, who is the son of the emperor. They come and bring order back to the situation. And they utterly crushed that rebellion in only the way the Romans could. They did, it, they did it slowly, methodically, and they did it completely. And once Jerusalem had been surrounded by the armies and that siege wall had been made, there's no getting it in or out except by your life by death. And so they encircled it, they laid siege to Jerusalem, and eventually they, they leveled the city. Now, something interesting that, that, I, that I was looking at this week, on a curious matter of history, as, as far as we know, um, virtually no Christians died in the destruction of Jerusalem because they listened to Jesus. You know, there's a Christian historian named Esubius, and he writes after the destruction of Jerusalem, and he explains that they, list, they listened to Jesus' words and, and uh, mostly fled to a, a city that was across the Jordan River, a city called Pella. And so very few, if any, Christians died in the destruction and the fall of Jerusalem. But, but look at verse 22. Look at that phrase. It says, for these are the days of vengeance. Now, according to Josephus, who is a, another historian, but he's a Jewish historian, he says 1.1 million Jews were killed and another 97 were taken captive, brought back to Rome, paraded around the city, and then cast out into, slave, into slavery, just like Jesus predicts here. That's what happened at the fall of Jerusalem. So truly, Jesus meant that this, when he says this is the day of vengeance, that this is, was the day of vengeance for the Romans. And this is why Jesus had such a heart we see now for the third chapter in a row, he's warning him people. They, they want people to turn to him and listen to him and escape this terrible calamity that comes upon Jerusalem. That's why in chapter 19, we see him in tears. He's weeping over Jerusalem in, verse, in chapter 19 because he knew about the massive destruction that was going to take place in 70 AD upon the city that he so loved. This is why he's warning everyone who will listen that they could flee from that destruction. And so now, if you make marks in your Bible, um, you can make a little line in the middle of verse 24. Uh, and so let's, let's look at the second part of verse 24 here. It says, And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So you can write a line right before that phrase right there. And, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Because that phrase is basically like a pivot, right? It, go, it goes from focusing upon what will happen in 70 AD to now looking forward to, uh, to what will happen at the end of the age. Because what follows was an occupation of Jerusalem for, for many, many centuries, the time of the Gentiles, as it says here. You see, the destruction of Jerusalem and the, you know, the, the, them becoming slaves and being dispersed as predicted by Jesus, there would be a, come a long period of time in Jerusalem that was dominated by Gentiles. And if you know your history, your 20, 20th century history, after thousands of years in exile, the, the, Jew, the Jewish state was miraculously established once again in the land of Israel in 1948. And it wasn't until 1968 that Israel controlled Jerusalem. 
But I would make an argument that it could be said that is still, even today, Jerusalem is being trampled by the Gentiles. And this is what I mean. If God had like a, I don't know, like a bullseye or, or, or his eye on any particular part of, of Jerusalem, if there was a bull, bullseye on the, on the target of Jerusalem, well, the Temple Mount would be that. The Temple Mount, right? That would be the center. Everything else would kind of radiate from that. It's a huge deal, the Temple Mount. And did you know that even today, the Israeli authorities yield the administration, the policing, and the governance of the Temple Mount to the Gentile rule? A Palestinian authority has it, which is a Gentile authority. And so you could say and make an argument that, prophetically speaking, Jerusalem is still being trampled by the Gentiles, as he says here, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. But notice that phrase, until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You know, I think that when these times of the Gentiles are complete, I, I believe that the remaining seven-year period appointed to the Jewish, at, as described in Daniel chapter 9, that, that's, that that stuff will begin. And, and, and he's describing it here, starting at verse 25. He's talking about the coming of the Son of Man. He says, And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, the stress of nations with perplexities, the seas and the waves will roar, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great, great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up, and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And so Jesus is now looking further into the future to the end of the age, to the coming of Jesus, the second coming. You see, the destruction of Jerusalem, it happened with great calamity and great disaster. And the end of the age, the glorious return of Christ, will also be preceded by a period of great calamity and disaster. I mean, look at how, how it's described here in verse 25 again. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and, the earth distress, uh, and, and on the earth distress of nation with perplexity. You know, history records no adequate fulfillment of those words in 70 AD or thereafter, right? That, that hasn't happened yet. Jesus is now looking at an aspect of his ultimate fulfillment of his return in the end of the age. Now, if you want an idea of what that looks like, you can go to the, the end of your book, end of the Bible, in Revelation. You can look at Revelation chapter 6. You can look at Revelation chapter 8 and 9 and Revelation chapter 15 through 18. All of that will accumulate into a dramatic, spectacular return of Christ coming with the church to the earth. Now look at how he describes it in verse 27. Then you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Again, none of that happened in 70 A.D., but that is yet to happen. Now, it will happen. And as Jesus will say at the end of this chapter, we should be ready. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I think we need to be ready, especially when people perceive that they're in the midst of this great calamity. And then in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus describes it as the great tribulation. We should see here in verse 28, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Now, I know there's a lot of different opinions about the end times, about the tribulation and post-millennial, uh, pre-millennial and all that stuff. And, but but I, I'm just going to share you what, about what, you, what I think. All right? I think that when those who believe in Jesus after the church is raptured, that the, these new believers... We'll look back at what Jesus is saying here and find encouragement in it, right? I think those who are trying to hang on and survive during the great tribulation can open up their Bibles and find great hope when Jesus says, look up for your redemption draws near. I think it give them so much hope and so much strength to endure and just say, you know what? As bad as this is, it's not going to last forever. He's going to come back for us and he may even come back sooner than I think. And this is why he says, Starting in verse 29, he said, well, he's basically saying when you see these signs, you know the end is near. And he gives a, a parable to kind of picture this. He says in verse 29, then he spoke to them in a parable. Look at the fig tree. But he, then he says, in all the trees, 
When they are already budding, you see and know for yourself that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happen, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till the, all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but he says, but my word will by no means pass away. So notice what he says here in verse 21. Jesus gives this little parable. I would even call it a mini parable. It's a very short one. He says, look at the fig tree. And, and the fig tree is just one example of a tree that buds before summer. And, and let me just give you my opinion here, all right? The, the fig tree, I don't believe that Jesus is focusing on the fig tree as a specific representation of Israel in this context. I, I think he's focusing on just the fact that a fig tree buds, and when it buds, something inevitably happens as, as a result, right? Summer is near. Fruit's about to bear. I mean, notice what he says in verse 29. He says, look at the fig tree. He says, and all the trees. And so I don't think it's the figginess of this tree that it's in view. It's the character of the tree. When it buds, summer is near. And so in the same way, Jesus is saying that when, you, when these cataclysms begin to happen, what he just described becomes on the earth, you know that the return is near. It inevitably will follow that. Then he says something very bold in verse 32. He says, Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Now, I think this verse has been a source of confusion for a lot of people. And I think some people, and I think incorrectly believe that Jesus said that he's going to return in one generation from his own departure from the earth. But I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think Jesus is looking at his disciples and saying, look, Peter, James, John, look, I'm going to come in one generation. I'm not going to come. I'm going to come back in your generation. You're not going to pass away until I return. I don't think that's what he's saying at all. I believe Jesus is referring to that generation that's going to see those signs and, and, and those cataclysms that he just m mentioned. Again, it's one of those precious promises to those new believers, those followers of Jesus that I believe will be after the rapture, that would be in the time of this great tribulation and great calamity, that they would find hope and say, hey, this isn't going to last forever. They can, they can take heart to this promise. Imagine this, this gives them so much strength and so much inspiration, especially in such a desperate and torturous time as the Great Tribulation. Now, I will say this. There's a strong case to be made that Jesus did not mean a generation in a sense of span of time. Uh, you know, as I was researching this, the, the ancient Greek word uh, that's translated their generation could also very legitimately be, be translated race referring to an ethnic people. And so Jesus may, may have been referring not to a period of time, but to the Jewish people. Because that's who he's speaking to after all, right? And, 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 it doesn't, and it's as if he's saying it doesn't matter how much persecution they come, that come across the Jews. It doesn't matter how many genocides come out against them. They will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. You know, and I look at, at Revelation, and I think about when it talks about the 144,000 of the, of the Jews that are going to be sealed, and it starts naming all the people from those tribes. I, you know, I, that fits into that, I believe. But then notice what it says in verse 33. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means pass away. And so we can look at this today. You know, these things that he's talking about, the, the destruction of Jerusalem and the end times hasn't happened yet. But one of them has happened at, at now, right? The destruction of Jerusalem. And we can look at that, and I think that, that God's word, he says, my words will not pass away. It comes true. It is true. And, then, and so I hope that is an encouragement to you, and, and it certainly is to me, that he is a man of his word. He said these things are going to happen, and his word is true. They won't pass away. I mean, who says that except God, right? I mean, who, who says that uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away? Who says that except God? Isaiah never said that. Uh, King David never said such a thing. Paul certainly didn't say anything. It, who except God would say that? And here Jesus is. The only way he would say that is if he was a blasphemer, if it, but he's not a blasphemer. And his promises do hold up. We've seen it time and time again, and we can know from that and through our faith that his promise about his return will come to fruition too. And so we get to verse 34 here. And, and I think this is the most important part of this chapter right here. Let's take a look at verse 34. But take heed to yourself. 
Least your heart be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day, speaking of his second coming, will come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always, get this, that you may be kind of worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Now notice what Jesus is saying here. In light of all the things about my coming, you better watch out. You, you better take care. You better, as he says here, take heed to yourselves. You know, there's certain things that will make you unprepared for his second coming. And, and Jesus lists some of them here. I don't think this is an exhaustive list by any means, but Jesus mentions carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. I think each one of these will make you unprepared for the coming of Jesus, his second coming. They can, what, what it says here, weigh you down. Friends, let, let me tell you, you don't want to be weighed down by, by these things. Why? Let's continue on. Verse 35 says, But it will come as a snare to all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. And i got to say, this kind of blows me away. Because, because what is a snare? A snare is a surprise. I mean, it has to be a surprise. And nobody deliberately walks into a snare. And so it's not a snare if there's no surprise element to it. And, and I think about that and I say, wait a minute, how could the coming of Jesus be a surprise? Didn't he just say that there's going to be the planets are shaking, the sun and the moon and all these things are, are going to be signs of, of calamity and destruction before his glorious return? How can he say that it's going to be a snare or a surprise? Because I think it's because when you go through Scripture and understand what Jesus says, that I'm honest, I'll be honest, frankly, it just seems that there's contradictory terms. All right? Sometimes he says, I'm going to return to this world in the midst of, of this great calamity. And other times he says, I'm going to return to the world with peace and safety and, and business as usual. And so that business as usual thing, that's, that's when he's going to come. It's going to come like a snare, like a surprise. But sometimes he says, I'm going to return to the earth with my church like a, like a glorious army. And other times he says, I'm going to meet the church in the clouds. So which one is it? He gives different ideas, different ideas of surprise and predictability and on and on. And I think the answer is this. is to say that there's two aspects of his coming that are, are distinct but separated by a certain amount of time. The first aspect comes suddenly, unexpectedly, like a snare in the time of peace and safety. The second aspect of Jesus' coming comes with its great anticipation uh, to the world that's almost destroyed by the wrath of God with Jesus coming with his church uh, with, in judgment from heaven. Now, those who are ready for the first aspect of his coming, notice what it says in verse 36. He says, watch therefore and pray always that you will be kind of worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. And so what are these things that they are going to escape? Well, it's the things of, of great calamity that will come upon the earth. And so do you understand what Jesus is saying? He's essentially saying there's an aspect of my coming that's going to come like a snare and a surprise. And if you're taken during that aspect of my coming, you will escape the things that are going to come upon the earth. And by the way, he doesn't say that you will be preserved in the midst of them. He says you will escape them and you, you will, notice in verse 36, you will stand before the Son of Man. Those who are caught up together with Jesus to meet the Lord in the air. That's how, that's how it's described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. They will escape the, the tribulation that comes upon the earth. They won't escape the, the persecution. They won't escape the trials and the difficulties that will happen before that. Right? But the great outpouring of the wrath of God that was appointed in the great, great tribulation, they'll escape that. I believe that's what Jesus is talking about here. Therefore, Jesus says, look at verse 36. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you will be kind of worthy to escape all these things. And, and, I, and I know that there's disagreements on the end times. You may not agree with everything I said, but if I can just kind of give you in a practical point, sort of sum up the, the return of Jesus in the, in the New Testament. 
on a practical point. I'm not talking about theology. Theology, and you know, we all may have different point point of views and have our reasons why we believe that. But on a practical sense, let me just sort of sum up the idea of Jesus' return like this: Watch and be ready. Watch and be ready. Again, you may not agree with me about the end times, but one thing is for sure on a practical level. We must watch and be ready for the return of Jesus. You know, if Jesus were coming back tonight for his church, would it be a snare and it would be like a a surprise, a snare? Would you be ready? Would you be ready? Or as it says here, would your heart be weighed down? You know, it's interesting, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, I mentioned that earlier. It describes God's people being caught up in the air to meet Jesus in the clouds, which sounds a little bit crazy. We're going to be like meeting Jesus in the clouds. I admit that sounds very strange, but, here's, but I picture this and I say, and I think how can we be caught up in the air to meet Jesus if we're being weighed down in, your, in our hearts? By what is it? He says, by a carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that list can go on and, and other things that are, that are preventing us from doing this. And, and I think about this. And I would rather have someone display a life that is thoroughly ready for the return of Jesus, and yet they disagree with me completely about how it, all the details of the end times, than to have someone who agrees with me perfectly about all the little details, and yet their life is not ready for the return of Jesus here and now. Because that's what's important. And so, friends... Let's watch and be ready. Prepare our lives. Now let's look at the last two verses as we close out our time together. And and in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. And so this is basically the the public nature of of Jesus' ministry, right? This shows first the simplicity of it. Like all these people were coming to Jerusalem and many pilgrims were camping out in the, the Mount of Olives and thousands of people in Jerusalem. And, and so he's kind of camping out in the Mount of Olives with his disciples. But secondly, notice the, his bravery. Jesus is so brave. The religious leaders we've already established are after him. We know, we know the end of the story. We know that they're going to kill him, put him on the cross at the end. They're going to arrest him. But what is he doing? He goes in the most public place possible, and he's teaching. That's what he's doing. That's the courage of Jesus. And and we're going to see that develop in in the following chapters as we get into it starting next week. So with that, let me me close uh, close us up in prayer. Father in heaven, God, I just pray that each and every person who hears this message this morning, that ultimately it would be ready for your return, the return of Jesus, that they would have their faith in you and not in themselves, and they would maybe repent if there's anything to repent of, their sins, and put their faith in you, and that they would not be weighed down by things like drunkenness and carousing and the cares of this life, or anything else that would weigh down a heart and make it not ready to fly. Lord Jesus, help us to watch and be ready. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.